Oh, sign the bike. Oh, I thought you were going to give me the bike. You might win it. Hold that. There you are. Sign the bike indeed. At our next mm. Fan X, one lucky person is going to win this bicycle. This motorcycle, nice. Done. Not a square inch untouched. Ladies and gentlemen, while you're watching John sign this bicycle, we're going to do a photo of what I would like you to do is all of you stand up and turn your phones on so we have light this way. Terrible then. More light. Light, light, light. Light it up, light it up. Now everybody smile. Which way do I turn? have homes to go to. How wonderful, what a wonderful reception. Then I always get a wonderful reception here in, in, in some things. Oh, chairs have appeared. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, come on. Hello, yeah. sir. Now, tell me your name again. My name's Larry Curtis. And what do you do for a living, Larry? Well, I'm a journalist, actually. A journalist? I work at KUTV, which is a local news station, but the other thing, thank you very much, to be very good. Left. Is it a good station? <laughs> and, and do we know of his work? It, uh, does it, um... It's online. This face doesn't get on TV, actually. What a loss to mankind. <laughs> uh, the other thing I... Good beard, though. Thank you, thank you. Yes, yes, yes. been working on that. Yes, yes. The other thing I do, I work for a website, work meaning volunteer, called theonering.net. And it has been my pleasure and privilege to have several encounters with John Rice Davies over the years, which uh, I'm afraid I'm going to have to brag about you for a minute. Oh, please do, please do. <laughs> now that mother's gone, who does? <laughs> So I guess that falls on me. So on my Facebook, you know how the memories crop up? Seven years ago today, John and I were at Dragon Con doing a panel a little bit like this. John was here for Fantasy Con about five years ago when we had him there. Thank you. At that Dragon Con show, there was a woman who had ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease. She was stricken in a wheelchair and we we were preparing to do the panel, and I went backstage, and there was John, and there were several other actors, and they were treating her like she was the most important person in the world. And maybe she was. And over the years, these many encounters with Mr. Davies, he, he's a great actor. There's lots of great actors. There's lots of celebrities that come, but there is no finer human than John. And that is... Well, that's too generous of you. Well, well, the evidence of this, John, is how he always treats fans. And it's always with respect and appreciation and love. So, acting is great, but treating people is greater. So, for that, let's give John a really big hand. That's, that's a far too generous and far too fulsome um, uh, account of my silly short life. Um, but let's take that as a starting point, shall we? <laughs> yeah, well, it's always about me, isn't it, really? Uh, but there, no, well, let's talk about that business of, of treating people well. Um, how many, how many people in this room, <laughs> sorry about that, uh, how many people in this room are shy? Quite a lot of you. Can I give you the short version of the shyness uh, talk? Look, I am going to, and all you young people should listen to this very carefully, because I am going to teach you the secret of wounding. I'm trying to find a way not to get feedback in this. Um, 
I'm going to tell you the secret of how to be an absolute success in your life. I'm, I mean an absolute success. Shyness is a form of vanity. Shyness means you think that everyone is looking at you. Now, when I come on the stage and, and, uh, and I see all you people out there, and I'm thinking, gosh, they're all looking at me and they're saying, why hasn't he got a suit on? Um, because uh, it got lost in the baggage last night. <laughs> I, I'm actually wearing somebody else's clothes. <laughs> there is no space that's safe. Let's try here. Um, yes, uh, if, I, if I say, gosh, they're all looking at me and they're thinking, gosh, he doesn't stand up straight anymore. He's getting very hunchbacked. He's shrinking a bit. He used to be big. He's, he's grey. If I start thinking like that, I can't talk to you. The only way I can talk to you is to assume that all you are afraid of meeting me and being judged by me. So, my job is to make you feel comfortable. And, 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 and that's the secret of success. And you all have that secret in you. Because you were all taught to say please and thank you and hello. And that's called manners. And good manners isn't just about knowing which knife and fork to use. Good manners is the art of making other people feel comfortable. And if you can do that, I promise you, you will be a success in life. There will be people who are more brilliant in you, perhaps. But they may not be anywhere near as successful as you because you are going to be the people that we look at when we say, I like being in his company. I like this person. You know, he listens, he's decent, he's kind, he's thoughtful. And he makes me feel good being in his presence. Now that's what I want you, all your little ones, especially, and uh, just one or two of your older ones who haven't quite got there, um, to practice. I want you to practice saying good morning to people when you see them, strangers or anything like that. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Oh, lovely day, isn't it? Now, some people will go... <laughs> and you will feel about that high. Don't worry about it. Next time you see them, repeat it. Good morning, sir. Good morning, good morning. Eventually, actually, even they will melt. But that's not the point. The point is that you reach out to incorporate and include other people. And if you can learn to do that well, you include yourself in what is best in humanity. And uh, there end of the lesson, I suppose, here. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so anybody got any, any questions? Good, good, good. Oh, oh. Sorry. Yes, oh. Yes, sir. Hello, who are you anyway? My name's T. Um, I was just wondering uh, if you could talk about how uh, you got the uh, part of Treebeard. I'm so sorry, I'm old and deaf. You'll have to. Uh... Well, I think the monitors are off up here. So uh, I was just wondering if you could talk about how you got the part of Treebeard, how that all came about. How you got Treebeard? How I got Treebeard? Well, I was doing Gimli, and one day PJ said to me, why don't you do Treebeard as well? And I thought, oh, yes, extra dosh, oh, yes. <laughs> Simple voice over this, no problems. I have to tell you, I still wake up at night sweating because I know I didn't get it right, and I don't know how to get it right. How do you do a walking, talking tree who doesn't have lungs, uh, what song would it make? And it's the oldest living thing on the earth. And of course, in the script, when, when you read the book, you say, oh, this is easy. He's very slow, Buraro. But, 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 
when you're trying to do it on camera, slowness kills it. If I was going... the audience. <laughs> you, you can't do it that way. I don't think you can actually do that part. At least I don't know how to do that part. I did talk about this to a wonderful man called Bob Hieronymus on a, BBC, uh, on a television, uh, uh, a radio talk show in New York once. And he had some friends of his who were talking scholars and um, and one of them wrote in to him and said, um, there is, of course, and he repeated this to me, there is, of course, only one actor in the world <laughs> who could do this properly. I swelled naturally a little bit, you know. <laughs> one has to be modest, doesn't one? And he said, uh, James O. Jones. <laughs> uh, I remember telling James that, and he said, yes, probably. <laughs> Next question. Um, so my name is Shannara. Ah. Named, yeah, named after the the, the book Chronicles. Series. Yes, exactly. Very good. Um, and so my question is, um, as from an actor's perspective, what was the difference between playing Gimli and, um, you know, a, like playing a dwarf versus an elf? What what challenged you more as an actor? Well, first of all, let me tell you why I did it. Uh, because I really wanted to be able to stand up on a big stage like this and say, from dwarf to elf king, eat your heart out, Orlando Bloom. The pointy eared cheating devil that he was in his. Uh, uh, Gimli represent Grimly. Gim, Gimli is the. Gimli is so much part of us. Gimli is all that is worst in us. The hostile, the xenophobic, the uh, aggressive, uh, the suspicious, the. Uh, Yes, He's, he, that's us, that's part of us. He is also the parts of us that we aspire to. The, the generous, the kind, the protective, the loyal, uh, and the fearless. Certainty of death, small chance of success. What are we waiting for? I, I'm sorry, I didn't really answer your question, but that's the best way to be, isn't it, when you really don't have an answer? You know what both. <laughs> yes? Hi, my name's Jessica. Um, I wanted to ask, in what ways have you seen the filming industry change in about the last almost 50 years that you've been acting? I, I'm so sorry, I didn't quite hear the operative word there. I got the 50 years of acting. <laughs> oh yes, well, the film industry's changed in the sense that on the worst side, as far as the people working in it, uh, the standard of living for, for people filming has fallen. Every modest actor who worked on a film could take home a decent pay packet. Everyone who worked in a studio, they had their little place up in the, the cabin up in the hills, as well as their place. But that's sort of vanished now. Uh, there is more of a, a steeper pyramid um, between those who have a great deal, and deservedly so. I'm not saying that don't have it uh, at the top, and, uh, and those at the bottom who 
really don't do terribly well at all, and that's got worse. On the good side, this is the great democratic age of filmmaking. Anyone these days can make a film. Many of you want to make a film, and that's what you should do. You buy a little video camera or even a, 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 an iPhone or something like that and get three friends together. You, you're playing the lead. You, madam, are going to be directing the film and you, young man, are going to be the villain. All right? And you shoot, you draw, you, you, you write a little two-minute movie and you edit it and next week you're going to do another one. Two-minute movie, that's all. Uh, and this time you're going to be the lead, you're going to be the villain, and you are going to be the director, cinema photographer, whatsoever. And that way you will learn all the bits that are necessary in front of the camera and behind the camera. If you hold the camera and watch somebody act, you realize what a bad actor you are. <laughs> because they're really into the part and you're trying to just get something in, in focus or so. They're not still when they should be still. And you will learn all those tricks by doing it. So you make a two minute movie, you get some more friends, you make another two minute movie. Each of you rotates so that you know all the things to it. And you bung it out there on YouTube. Nobody will watch it. Nobody will watch the next one. But by the fifth one or tenth one, after you've done ten two-minute movies, then you begin to start realizing what you really want to do. So you make a five-minute movie, and guess what? Five people see it and like it. And you learn your craft that way. Whichever the craft it is, film, maker, film director, film writer, film actor. And that's one of the glories of this age. Suddenly we have a curious meritocracy, a, a curious democracy in filmmaking. And that's, this is a glorious age to be a young filmmaker. Or even an old one. Ooh, <laughs> Hey John, hey John. Uh, it's great to see you. I'm a big fan. I was wondering, what is your, what was your favorite part, what was your favorite scene in Lord of the Rings to uh, film? Ah, right. What about... Don't tell the elves. <laughs> now, I see you're asking this question on behalf of somebody very lovely. Who, who is this little person? Um, this is Diana. She's my daughter. She's four months old. Oh, welcome to the world, Diana. <laughs> uh, She's happy to be here, I think. Hey. Um, and we're happy you're here. I, you're a bit of a legend yourself, but you've worked with some legendary directors. I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about working with someone like Steven Spielberg. Uh, was that a question? He, he's a legendary director, and I have talked about him, but... Um, yes. Steven Spielberg. If, if we were living in an age where there was no sound at all, Steven Spielberg would be the greatest film director, I think, of all time. Because he can tell a story through a camera lens, I think, better than any director that I've ever known, anyway. Uh, I mean, he is a master. But, you know, the... I mean, the, the man who directed Patton. Uh, he knew a little bit about filmmaking as well. My old friend J.D. Thompson, who directed The Guns of Navarone. 
Peter Jackson does know a little bit about directing too. Um, you work with exceptional, exceptional directors. If you if you work long enough and you and you're lucky enough to work with, and and, and just mentioning those four names means I'm excluding another 500 directors that I probably worked with, um, all of whom I could sort of give you a five minute. And a disputation about their, their strengths and weaknesses, but all really good. By and large, you don't get to be in the top rankings without having exceptional skill. Daddy can't really buy you that. He can buy you a camera, a script, he can buy you whatever, but in the end, it's how you use the camera, use the words, Use the actors and use your crew. Great directors are great man managers. And that's a hugely important thing. Just the ability, the, the, the important skills of learning how to live with your fellow man and get the best, best out of them. The best managers have green fingers for people. The best managers are those who can look at somebody who has flaws and difficulties and issues and things like that and say, that's his real strength. How do we bring that out? And then when you're bringing that out, you can say, now you've got a real strength there. Now your weaknesses, tell me your weaknesses again. Yes, you're right. Now make your weaknesses your real strengths. And the people, in the end, it's how we relate to each other how we allow each other to flower, that's what it's about. Marriage is about letting the other person flower uh, and helping the other person to flower. And in our own ways, that's what we as parents do. Uh, you know, we look at these little babies and we want to do everything to help this baby be the most extraordinary person on the planet. And I want your daughter to be like that because I've got a daughter who's a little bit older and I want her to be like that. It's, it's being comfortable in our own power and strength, understanding our own vulnerabilities and allowing those around us to become bigger and better and more glorious uh, than they are. And that's still making really, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> So my question was, in Raiders of the Lost Ark, when you got kissed and smiled and hummed while you walked away, was that scripted or was that improv? <laughs> well, my version of the truth is this. I turned up to do my very first day's work on the film which in the mad logic of filmmaking was actually my very last scene in the film. I turned up to do a scene which said, Indian Marion say a sorrowful goodbye to Sala. I turn up and Stephen is sitting there cross-legged on the quayside in La Rochelle going dut, 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 dut. and I say, um, what are you doing? He said, writing your scene. <laughs> oh, my character wouldn't say that. He'd be more likely to say da 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 All right, da 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 And if you could favor me by doing da 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 as well, be grateful. Oh, by the way, your character at the end, when he's high or happy, he bursts into Gilbert and Sullivan. Incorporate that at the end of the scene, will you? <laughs> I drew myself up to my then six foot one. I've shrunk. I drew myself up to my full six foot one and looked at him and said, well, this is what I was going to say. I was going to say, Mr. Spielberg, I am a classical actor. I need weeks and weeks to prepare. And I said, okay.
What I do? <laughs> the man in Indy's hat. It covers a multitude of sins. <laughs> Different subject, though. You played one of my all-time favorite villains, Quill and Gort, in Noble House. Many actors have very strong feelings about playing villains versus heroes. As a professional, how does that fall for you? Oh, villains are such fun, aren't they? Most actors will tell you. you know, most actors will tell you that they uh, that a really good villain and, and gaunt is. Gaunt is no. I've got children present. I cannot use those words. Um, uh, but 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 he is. He's a grade one illegitimate fellow, if you know. What I mean. Uh, but, uh, but, um, but, but again, you know, like all great villains, he has great strengths. I mean, he is as cool uh, as it comes when the, when, the, uh, uh, when the restaurant is burning and this sort of thing. And, uh, you know, that's the sort of thing uh, even a villain knows how to do well when he's got class. But, um... You know, it doesn't always go down well with your mother. I, I went down to Wales where my mother was living and I said, Hello, Mum. Oh, lovely to see you. Lovely to see you. <sighs> Cup of tea. I, I'll have some food for you in a minute. Yes. Nothing. Uh, so, Mum, did you, did you see that... Uh, that part I played on television last week? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Well? Oh, you, you, you took the part very well, didn't you? I, I will say that, you took the part very well. But, but look, John, I mean, couldn't you ask the producers nicely to let you pay a nice person for a job? Because you see, the neighbors talk. <laughs> well, John, I'm just saying my question is, why was it like to you know, play on Precious Science 2 with Julie Andrews? What an honor to work with Julie. I, I, I want to work, what an honor to work with any of those wonderful actors. Uh, it, it, it was, it was one of those wonderful films where you can't wait to get on the set in the morning because you know you're going to be laughing most of the day. Uh, it, 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 and Judy, well, Judy is an icon anyway. I mean, I, I never thought that Julie, and Julie was a huge star in the 60s and 70s. Um, huge star. But never really got, I think, a full understanding of the talent that she really had. I mean, she was a world-class singer. She was a world-class dancer. She was a damn good actress. I'm sorry, I'm not allowed to use those words here. I think about my, uh, she was an exceptionally good actress. And, uh, uh, but more than that, you know, she was as down to earth and as delightful a person as you could hope to meet. Uh, that's what works working in vaudeville. And she'd been brought up in a, in a stage basket hamper, you know, really. She, you know, you... You have to learn how to get the best out of people. You have to learn how to work. And, and, and she knew that. Oh, by the way, there is one other thing that I would sort of append. I'll get back to it in a second. Um, to the previous sermon I gave. Uh, for actors, or for you who are writers, or creative people, there's two lines from Dr. Johnson that you should have written on a plaque and put the plaque on the wall so that when you wake up in the morning, you see it. And the lines are these. The drama's laws, the drama's patrons give. And we who live to please must please to live. 
If you lose sight of that, you will fail. If you keep that constantly in your heart, one day you may be lucky enough to succeed. The drama's laws, the drama's patrons give. And we who live to please must please to live. Sorry, to get back to it. <laughs> yes. Judy, wonderful. Lovely, lovely woman. Funny, intelligent, bright, cooperative, sympathetic, warm, gentle. All the qualities that good people should have, in fact, let alone great actresses. Hmm. Oh. So, John, I want to ask a, a little follow-up to that question. You, you've mentioned amazing names from stage that you've worked with. Have you ever in your career been starstruck? Have you ever worked with an actor or a, or a director who is just leaves you breathless? Indeed. I, when Lord of the Rings came out and I used to do one or two talks about the film and things like that, there was always some shy little girl who would get up in the audience and she would say, um, John, um, did you and Orly hang out a lot together? And I had very gently to point out the fact that he was 19 and I was 55. <laughs> And had I been hanging out a lot with him together, you would indeed have had time to raise your eyebrows slightly, I think, yes. But um, my, he is a marvellous actor. Um, marvellous. Look, the truth of the matter is, actors are a funny lot. I've, I've, I remember once working for several months with an actor who was dead. You know, everything was false. Nothing he said had any sincerity. Nothing that he did had any conviction. I wrote him off. A year later, I was joining a, another repertory company and I, I got up there and the first thing you do is you slip into the back of the stalls and you watch the, the current play that's on. And there was one chap in there who was extraordinary. And I, I, saw, I, I sort of, I, at this distance I can't quite see who you are, but there's something about you, but by God you're good. You're so good. And at the interval, somebody left a, a program there, and I looked at it, and this was the actor that I'd completely written off eight months, ten months before. Sometimes, people go through a fallow period. Sometimes people just go through a period where everything they touch goes wrong. And, and, and you may have had it. Sometimes there are whole years like that when everything we do just, just goes wrong. The, the, the words we use irritate people or are taken out of context or, you know, we, we there are just some years when it doesn't work. But if you stick at it, you can come back. And, and that's the most extraordinary thing I find about my fellow actors. Do I find exceptional actors? Yes. I worked with a young actress the other day. It was rather like looking at a Stradivarius. If only the director had known how to play. Uh, just amazing. And you see young actors sometimes, you think, oh, wonderful, wonderful. And, and there comes a point in your life when you're so old, it's not a matter of competition anymore. So you can actually go up and say, look, don't do that. Think about doing it that way. You know, it's stronger. You know, take a bit more space. Uh, and they go, Oh, yeah, well, he's been around a bit, so I'll give it that way. And suddenly, you know, there's, 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 there's applause from the audience. There are lots of tricks that old men can pass on to young men and, and, and to young women as actors. And, and we do, 
It's part of our strange apostolic succession. I worked with John Gielgud. John Gielgud was, I think, either the godchild or the nephew of Ellen Terry. Ellen Terry worked with Irving. Irving had seen, and it goes back, and we all learn tricks, terrible stories, wicked stories that I will not embarrass you with. Oh, but they're very funny. Um, uh, going back to Shakespeare. Um, have a look and see what, uh, what the Vicar of Stratford wrote in his diary in 1621, a story about Shakespeare and, and, uh, and Burbage playing Richard III. Uh, just as a footnote, boys and girls, boys in particular, girls are very perverse. If you, if, you, if, you, if, if you really want to see the stranger side of female nature, go and watch them uh, looking at a great performance of, of Richard Crookback. But I, that am not shaped for sportive tricks. They're queuing up to see him afterwards outside the thing. Um, and anything with vampire teeth in it, well, girls will go for that. I'm sorry, this has been completely irrelevant, hasn't it? But then, what did you expect? <laughs> Will that do? Oh, you haven't asked your question yet. Ah, oh, yes. No wonder I was a little bit lost thinking, what the heck did she say? Okay, yes, sir. Okay, it works. Hi, so my question is, so, you know, there is an Indiana Jones, right? Ed does he have, which has this groovy little news clip in it which you are in. So my question, I repeated that, is, have you ever ridden the ride, and if so, do you close your eyes? <laughs> the first three times I went to Disneyland to do the ride, it wasn't working properly. <laughs> the last time I took my then, I think she was six or seven year old daughter, uh, and we got the star treatment. Of course, the star treatment means that you don't stand in line uh, listening to Salah warning you and doing all the prattle. So she doesn't associate me with that. In fact, I think she only saw Raiders of the Lost Ark the other day. Ha hasn't seen Lord of the Rings yet. 13 years old, causes of my daughter. I shall look at the postman a little more closely. <laughs> Right, yes, will that do? I, I love it. Actually, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I, I, I don't get scared of heights. Um, in fact, I quite like them. But then I, I used to fly a plane, so not much point in trying a, flying a plane unless you can, you can stand a bit of height. <laughs> it's, it's, it's that last 20 feet that are crucial ones. <laughs> I was in a plane in Zimbabwe in 1985 and we took off six of us, well five of us, six of us actually, and a baby in arms and a little single engine piper. And we got about 20 feet above the ground and started hitting the tops of trees. And shortly after that it became very agricultural. <laughs> so yes, but, no, but, but yes, no, I didn't. But thank you for asking the question. Hello. Good day to you. I was wondering if you had any funny stories from Lord of the Rings with Legolas. Who? <laughs> well, there is a story that I have to repeat because uh, falsehoods have been put out. It concerns a certain uh, training day when we were all instructed in the arts of using canoes. <laughs> the dwarf and the elf were put in a canoe together. The dwarf, having had some nautical experience, was not unwilling to impart a bit of his, bit of his wisdom to this young pointy-eared devil. <laughs> um, 
unfortunately, the canoe sank. <laughs> and as he emerged spluttering from the water, the elf blamed the dwarf. <laughs> we had lunch, and afterwards, new teams into the canoes together to learn. This time, the elf was paired with a hobbit. <laughs> and guess what? <laughs> the blasted canoe sank again. <laughs> so what I'm saying is don't go paddling with pointy-eared devils. <laughs> This is our last question. Oh. So make it count. I have a question for you about the Quest for Glory game Shadows of Darkness. What was it like being the narrator in the Sierra PC game 1993 with Jesse Harnell and Bill Farmer? Because they were in those games too, you know? Tell us your experience about being a narrator. You're asking me to recount in some detail a day's work on a video game in 1993. <laughs> it was one of those perfect California days. <laughs> I stepped outside, dived into the pool, and had a little swim and thought, ah, going to be stuck in a little sound stage for a day to day. How oh, depressing. Anyway, uh, actually, I don't think I had a pool, but there, I thought I should have had. Um, uh, forgive me, old chap. I, 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 I don't mean this in any disparaging way, but I have not the slightest idea. I don't think I ever saw the game. Oh, let's have a look. Um, The Quest for Glory, ha! Oh. Where's that cover art for the PC game, for the Sierra game? Ah! Where's that cover art for the Right! <laughs> you may be talking to the only person on Earth who thinks that PC means politically correct. <laughs> I would like to show you my phone, because it always gets a good laugh. It's a Nokia 6310i. <laughs> My dear chap, I'll tell you what, the fun you have in the studios with these guys is great. They are, they're locked up developing these programs and occasionally they allow madmen from the outside to come in and do them. And it's, it's, it, 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 it's, it's sort of like having a party in the unrelieved gloom, gloom of programming. Uh, at least I, that's what I take it to be. I mean, it's all magic to me. Uh, hmm. But that wasn't very helpful to you, and I do apologize. Um, and I can find no relief for you whatsoever. <laughs> Thank you, John. I think that was a pretty great answer all the same. Salt Lake City and Utah, let us thank John Rhys Davies in an unforgettable way. Everybody, give a huge round of applause for John Rhys Davies! Well done for all these kind and generous immigrants, the fabulous people, and I thank you so much. You guys, I have to say, I don't get starstruck very often, but you are in my very favorite movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark. One more time, give a huge round of applause. The best figure in Egypt. And if any of you need a little bit of gardening done, the boys are looking a little bit poor at the moment, and there's the absence of work, so never knowingly undersold. Yes. Diggers, freely available from Egypt. Oh.